Hello and welcome to tonight's 2016 presidential election discussion. I'm here with Dr. Brian King and Dr. Jason, great, J Jason Kerberg. Kerberg, yes, thank you. And you are Associate Professor of Political Science here at Muskingum right. and you are Assistant Professor of Political Science here at Muskingum. So as we all know, the political season dating back to last year has been one of the most controversial in U.S history, arguably. So we'll just keep that in mind through through this discussion. The first question I'd like to propose to both of you is, what do you think about the relationship between the political candidates, whether it's Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, or even the third party candidates, and the mass media? So King, if, Dr. King, if you'd like to start. Yeah, I think Donald Trump has the mass media to thank for his candidacy. Um, he was born on mass media. He was fed on mass media. He got, I think by one estimate, um, well over a billion dollars in the equivalent of free advertising and news stories. Um, he also potentially has mass media to blame uh, for doing the same things they were doing when he was the media darling. Uh, he got their attention. They never let go. And whenever he's doing something that's less than optimal for his campaign, well, they're still right there. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely true that Donald Trump has definitely used the mass media as his uh, tool for his lack of campaign funding for uh, advertisements and so forth. And then you also have that Hillary Clinton has an interesting dynamic in that she tries to keep the mass media at arm's length as much as possible by not doing interviews, by not doing press conferences. And this sort of allows the mass media uh, much more free reign in the story arcs that they portray of her versus her having some control over what they report. And so you have these very two opposite dynamics going on uh, within both campaigns. Uh, what would you say about the third party candidates and their exposure in the mass media? Because obviously they don't have the names like Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. And so let's start with a libertarian candidate, um, Gary Johnson. Um, how do you see him in the mass media? Well, at first there was nothing right? mm -hmm. uh, for whether it was Gary Johnson or Jill Stein or, or anyone else, really. When media started noticing uh, the libertarian candidate, uh, Johnson sort of wilted under the lights. Uh, we had the Aleppo moment, and then he couldn't name a foreign leader that he admired, uh, and other things like that that maybe he wasn't quite ready for prime time. Yeah, and the media loves a horse race. And so yeah. when you have, so that's why the focus is on two major candidates mm -hmm. in most elections. And so by the time they did start paying attention to Gary Johnson, it was more of a spoiler role. Uh, mm -hmm. The fact that he's doing better than most libertarian candidates or any third party candidates have done since Ross Perot uh, in our elections. So that became a story in itself. And then as uh, Dr. King mentioned, he wilted. Uh, he just couldn't seem to handle the, or wasn't prepared for the attention that he suddenly started receiving as a possible potential spoiler into the election. Um, and if I may, uh, the fourth candidate, Joe Stein, she hasn't had quite as much as even Gary Johnson, and the some coverage that she has gotten is more of her role in the Dakota Access Pipeline. Right. So um, do you think she is deserving of any spotlight? Well, I, I think it's notable that she went to the pipeline protest, she intentionally broke the law, and she still didn't get headlines. Okay. That, you know, there's, I think we were just discussing this, that there's a warrant out for her arrest and for her vice president, um, vice presidential, presidential candidate's arrest as well. And, and it's not headlines. Um, talking about the spoiler, mm -hmm. CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, they're paying attention to Evan McMullen in Utah instead, who might win Utah and, you know, if 50 other things happen, um, suddenly we go to the House of Representatives. Well, I mean, one of the primary reasons why they're paying attention to McMullen is it's the six electoral votes of Utah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Donald Trump needs to basically win all the conservative states or all the red states, and then he needs to almost run the entire uh, gambit for all the battleground states. So those six electoral votes in Utah can be a spoiler in itself, mm -hmm. even though 
McMullen's not going to win any other states. He's only on what, 10 or 11 total ballots. Right. Um, so, he, so he has no chance of winning the popular vote, but those six electoral college votes can be crucial for the Trump campaign to win. Okay. And then moving on, our second question is, um, there's this term that, that has sprung up from some people that says, we are voting for a vice president rather than a main president. Um, Dr. Kerber, I'll start with you. So what, what is your opinion on that remark? It, it comes down to a lot of the distrust and the um, anxiety over the two major presidential candidates, Hillary Clinton and uh, Donald Trump, uh, and particularly uh, among the millennials and the uh, moderates who are unhappy with both. And so for many of them, I think it's a look at, well, which of the VPs do I like or which platform I like better than the actual candidate themselves? Coach King? It's, it's just amazing to me that people are looking past the presidential candidates to determine their vote, and, and that just simply doesn't happen. Um, I don't know a time when I've said I, I hate this presidential candidate, but wow, this VP is amazing. I'm going to vote for them. Um, but the dislike is just so strong on both sides with both candidates. Um, and there's another element to it, and it's one that's not being discussed a lot. But, you know, the possibility that one or, or both of these candidates, due to age or quirks of personality, might not serve out a full term, um, might put these vice presidents in the spotlight. Uh, there was wild speculation months ago that maybe Donald Trump doesn't doesn't want to be president, he wants to be elected president, so we're really voting for, for Pence. Uh, the possibility amongst Trump supporters that maybe Hillary Clinton is spending some time in a jumpsuit instead of in the Oval Office, or the fact that Donald Trump, if elected, is going to be, I believe, the oldest uh, inaugurated president in American history. And you've got to think that potentially there's some health issues there on both sides. Our next question is, so in 2012, between President Barack Obama and Governor Mitt Romney, the total voter turnout was approximately 55%, which is pretty low, considering the magnitude of the presidential election. Do you think the total number of voters will be higher than the 55% or lower than the 55% considering the candidates mm. and the supporters behind them? And why or why not? So Dr. King, I'll start with you. That's a tough one. Uh, we had 55, we had 58 or almost 60 in 08. And as political scientists, we were giddy because that was mm -hmm. amazingly high and that's it's kind of sad. Uh, We've had turnout less than 50%. I, I remember in 96, Bill Clinton was reelected by less than half of less than half of all people elig eligible to vote. Um, I think there's a lot of this, of this campaign that's going to suppress turnout. Uh, people are just sick of the election. There's some negative out there. But on the other hand, there is such a, a vociferous dislike of these candidates that the other side might be more energized to come out to vote against that person. Yeah, it's going to be a fascinating dynamic because, as you know, it seems like as many people as Trump turns away, he's bringing people in who have not traditionally voted. Mm -hmm. And so the question becomes, you know, is there a net gain or not there for him uh, and overall? And at the same time, as you know, as much as Hillary's disliked, particularly among Republicans, the dislike is so strong that they might turn out disliking both candidates, but feeling the need that they actually have to vote against her in the election, mm -hmm. and vice versa for uh, Trump. So it, it's, it's going to be hard to predict the voter turnout. Um, I mean, where the biggest possible gains are is in that age group of 18 to 25, which seem to be the most disheartened by the candidates who are running for president. Yeah, you might see some that felt the burn, so to speak, right. who just aren't feeling it for anybody else and maybe don't turn out. I, I think another aspect of this, and, and I think Dr. Kerber could speak to this more from an expert point of view than I could, um, in terms of racial and ethnic demographics. Uh, so far, early voting 
numbers suggest that maybe African American voting has been decreased some, and we sort of expected that might happen. Um, Hispanic er early voting is up. So these dynamics play a part, I think, as well, and we're not sure exactly what to expect, but the early signs are, you know, maybe a higher Hispanic vote might be might be a turning point in the, in the election. Yeah, I mean, in 2008 and 2012, because you have Barack Obama running for president and it's a historical event, the African-American turnout increased. Mm -hmm. um, Percentage-wise of the vote, of the African-American vote, he didn't get much more than previous Democratic presidents. So the African-American vote's about usually 90 to 94 mm -hmm. percent. But the turnout uh, increased, which actually put um, a couple more states possibly in play for him that were traditionally in play. But the Hispanic vote is uh, one of the largest growing categories, uh, particularly them in the Asian American vote. Mm -hmm. And with Donald Trump's position of anti-immigration, uh, need to build a wall, uh, many uh, Hispanics, even Hispanic citizens who are not immigrants have family connections who are immigrants. And so they might feel that group threat which will motivate, motivate them to turn out to vote. Yeah, and this could have an impact in states like Florida, Arizona, um, others that you know might normally be in Trump's pocket by now, but mm -hmm. aren't. Yeah, and some battleground states like Colorado might be moving more blue right. than normal. Mm -hmm. Next question is, why do you think the rest of the world is so would be so interested in this election? There's a lot at stake. Mm -hmm. uh, it, doesn't really matter what part of the world you go to, the policies that are being discussed amongst the parties and the candidates in this election are gonna have pretty deep impacts, whether it's economic, political, military. Uh, if you look at the Middle East, for example, you see that there are definite preferences uh, amongst state actors, amongst non-state actors. I mean, ISIS probably even has its, its preference. Um, Iran. Iran State TV aired the third debate live with a streaming translation with a commentary afterward by their political leadership that said, look, this is what democracy is. Look how rude they are to each other. Look how terrible it is. Um, they're interested because whether or not we have free trade or fair trade, whether we put boots on the ground or don't put boots on the ground somewhere, whether we intervene or back an ally or don't, these are going to have a huge impact. I mean, a large part of Donald Trump's appeal has been to individuals who feel that they are losing underneath the current international globalization system. Mm -hmm. And he addresses a lot of those appeals. You know, he talks about free trade, ending, ending free trade agreements or renegotiating them. And so, I mean, that's an economic consideration for these other countries to have an impact. And then he starts talking starts talk about military, like NATO, you need to renegotiate NATO and make these NATO members pay for a larger share of the U.S. military protection, mm -hmm. uh, or pulling back the protection from Japan. I mean, these are things he's discussed that have real world, everyday consequences for these other countries. And so they are paying very close attention to what the world's superpower is going to decide for their next leader. And let's face it, it's a spectacle. Mm -hmm. And the world loves a spectacle. What is your reaction to the response from some of the supporters for one candidate or another, even the Bernie Sanders supporters, even though their candidate is not in the running? So what, what is your reaction to some of their responses to some of the candidates or their opposition as well? It's, it's a fascinating dynamic because in political science over the last decade or so, we've been talking about how strong and how important partisanship is. That it's stronger than political ideology, you know, liberal versus conservative, that being a Republican or being a Democrat is a extremely strong predictor of people's ad, um, attitudes and their voting behavior. And so then when you see Bernie, uh, Bernie supporters going, yes, I'm a Democrat, but I can't vote for Hillary. She's not Bernie. Or you see Republicans uh, leaderships lining up telling their supporters I can't vote for you know Donald Trump I mean the, our governor here in Ohio Kasich wrote in John McCain it from a scholarly standpoint it's fascinating that this extremely strong predictor is extremely weak in 
among certain, some of these groups. And so for me, that's very fascinating. And I think the character of the two cam, not the two campaigns, but the two candidates, the character issue comes in and it, it sort of overshadows, and if, if you will, throw shade on these, on these party dynamics and on these partisan considerations. Um, I've been calling it uh, mental gymnastics that some people are engaged in where, okay, I need to put my arm behind my back, I need to tie my leg across the table, and then I need to go upside down and hold my breath for 15 minutes just to be able to make logical sense of what my candidate just said so that I can still support them. It, just, it boggles my mind how easily some people are willing to do that in the name of you know, not having their point of view challenged or changed in any way. And that seems to be, you know, the opposite. That seems to be the very partisan people yeah. who are like, okay, I, I'm a Republican. I have to support Trump. I'm a Democrat. I have to support Hillary. Even though I don't believe in these things, I'm going to somehow try to justify mm -hmm. my support. What is your opinion on the theory that Donald Trump isn't in this to actually win? He's just out there to put his name out there, so to speak. His name's been out there right. for ever, right, since the 80s. I don't think he needed to run for president if he wanted to have a media empire or mm -hmm. if he needed to have an ego trip. I, I think there were plenty of other avenues to take. Um, I, my personal view from what I've read and listened to and saw and, and have seen about his personality, he needs to win. Um, and so once he was in, he was in to win. He was in till the end. There was no getting rid of him. Um, there was no admitting defeat or backing out. Or stepping down. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think a lot of that theory has to do with what seems to be very amateur blunders his campaign has done, uh, has committed, um, and just the way he tried to run his campaign, which is very non-traditional. I mean, I'm originally from Iowa. This is what we call in Iowa what we call retail politics. You're expected to go door to door. It's a very humbling experience as a, as a presidential candidate. You're expected to, to meet people in their in their homes and dis, and discuss politics with them. And Trump figured didn't do any of that. He flew in, had a big rally, and he flew out. and And so for many of people, that just seemed to be that's just not the way it works. Uh, and so it seemed to be well, he's not really in this because he's doing things differently. Um, so I think that's a large part of that theory. And this gets back to mass media. He used his name, he used the gravitas mm -hmm. of his presence, of his, what we might call a, a Q rating uh, in the business world, to, to play on the fact he was going to get major media attention just for flying in and having a rally. And so he wouldn't need to go door to door. And the establishment hates that. Um, any other candidate who would have tried that would have been dead in the water, but it worked for him. Speaking of Donald Trump, one of his main focal points with his campaign since day one of his candidacy where he announced his candidacy is that he wants to build a wall on the U.S.-Mexico border. So um, what is your opinion on that as to whether or not it's a good idea or if it would even be logical. So. It's illogical. It won't work. Um, it's too costly. I mean, there are just so many factors built into it. I mean, the, the length of the border between the U.S. and Mexico is just so long. Part of it is river. Part of it's mountains. Part of it's just open desert. All these factors will increase uh, the cost of building and maintaining a wall. And then you have the problem that it doesn't solve the problem. Uh, forty some percent of immigrants enter the country legally, but they overstay their visas. So a wall can't stop them from entering the country. And we've already tried fences and other barriers along there. And it, illegal immigration, as well as the drug cartels who cross the border, it's a business. It's a large business, um, and you find ways around obstacles when you are doing a business. So in the case of the drug cartels, we're finding tunnels that have built, been built underneath sections that are so sophisticated that they actually have cement floors, running electricity, and a rail system added into them. 
Uh, they're buying houses on both sides of the borders and building the tunnels between the two houses. I mean, and so you look at all these things, it just won't work. Um, but the wall, and don't get me wrong, I, I, I don't think he's talking about a metaphorical wall. He's yeah. talking about a physical wall. Mm -hmm. But I think the wall is a symbol. Mm -hmm. It's, I think, one of the prime symbols of the disenchantment, the disheartment, the, the frustration that his base feels that the society is sort of leaving them behind. They've lost their jobs. They're blaming you know, everyone else especially the people that don't look and talk and behave like us. Uh, and so this is sort of the one of the centerpieces of the symbolism of the frustration and the discontent that his base has. And so, of course, he's going to continue ringing that bell uh, because he keeps bringing more, more people to the rallies. And it is very symbolic. I mean, these are, many of his supporters see these political issues like illegal immigration, globalization, and... For most people, including many scholars, we don't see the, how complex these issues are. And so we think there are easy solutions to them. And so a wall sounds like an easy solution. It, I mean, it can be very frustrating to understand how the, US, the world's superpower, the U.S. largest military, can't control a border, its own border, much less police the entire world. Uh, and so when somebody comes out and has one of these solutions that feel that for many people in their gut they feel this sounds like it will work, they grasp and they buy onto it. And it's very accepting that, yes, we can build a wall and this will solve the problem. Next question kind of goes back to the one where people were people were asked where if Donald Trump actually wants to win. Um, what do you think about the theory that Donald Trump outward portrayal, so to speak, is more of an act than anything else, than his actual personality. I've, I've heard that too, I'm, I'm sure you have. Um, and it's undeniable that, I mean, he's a TV personality, he understands the dynamic of a character. Um, and we hear from all sorts of Trump surrogates and people that know him from before the campaign. He's, he's this warm person, he's got a great sense of humor, he really listens, he respects people. Um, that may or may not be true, but you would imagine that in a year and a half, or almost a year and a half since his candidacy, we would have seen that on the campaign trail uh, at least a few times, and I don't know that we've seen that. Yeah, I don't know how much of when we get that he's different behind the scenes is uh, personalities are different, our policy positions are different. Um, because, you know, it's hard to go into those details. I mean, I know that his surrogates say he's very understanding. Ben Carson has made comments that, you know, he's felt very comfortable around him, that they've, mm -hmm. you know, talked candidly, and he's very different. But then you have people like, I can't think, the person's name is autobiographer, who says, no, this, this is the Trump that you, you see on the cameras, the Trump you see behind the scenes. Um, and it seems a lot of times they're talking about different things, like they're talking about, Ben Carson seems to talk a lot about, a little bit about policy differences, and people who say he's the same are talking a little bit more about personality. And so I don't know quite what that dynamic differences are. But, I mean, at this point, I'm not too sure that, you know, what we're seeing is not what he is behind the scenes. Because as uh, Dr. King put it, he's had plenty of time to show us, and he's had a lot of incentive to show us. Right. Uh, being able to humanize himself <coughs> would have gone a long way to increasing his numbers uh, among independents and moderates, people he needs to draw into his campaign. Now, let's let's shift, oh, before I move on to Hillary Clinton, the last question about Donald Trump is, what positive aspect can people draw from Donald Trump, if any? He seems to, uh, have a very good, keen sense of the media, uh, which can be, if used correctly, can be a very uh, powerful tool for the president to be able to um, persuade support base. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if, you know, if he does get elected, if he's able to 
translate that from being a more conflicting use of the media to a tool of persuasion. But he does seem to have a very strong um, media presence. Yeah, I'd, I'd even go farther than that and I'd say he can play the media like the fiddle uh, on a good day. He can he can pretty much manipulate what the headline is going to be mm -hmm. and, and, and what angle they're going to tell the story from. I think also, though, he's got a... He's got this knack for understanding his base of people in a way that almost no public official at the national level can do. Um, I've, I've said this in a number of different uh, environments. Regardless of who wins next Tuesday, mm -hmm. this group of people who are Trump supporters need to be taken seriously. They need to be paid attention. They need to be respected. Uh, whether you know, the, the country agrees or disagrees with their point of view. We're talking millions of people who are disaffected and disenchanted. <coughs> Excuse me. And he, he sees that. And he knows how to put his finger on that pulse in a way that no one else in American politics can. Now let's shift gears here and talk about the Democratic nominee, Hillary Clinton. We know that Donald Trump has had his fair share of controversy, whether it's the build a wall, his comments on... Muslim Americans, and so forth. And then Hillary Clinton has the, the email scandal and then the Benghazi scandal as well as her main two. And then plus people have brought up Bill Clinton's scandals in the past. And then despite that, Clinton still shows to be about 6% in the poll up on Trump as of now, roughly about 6%. Why do you think her controversies don't impact her as much as Trump's? I think they do, actually. Okay. Um, the way I, I look at, at the, the way that the campaign unfolded, the Republicans could have picked anyone, just pick random generic Republican out of a box, mm -hmm. put them on the campaign trail against Hillary Clinton, and that person would have won unless it was Donald Trump. Uh, that Donald Trump brings enough negatives that he's having a much harder time defeating her than maybe another Republican would. Had it been Mike Pence or had it been uh, Jeb Bush or, or Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz mm -hmm. even, who's in and, of, in and of himself sort of, you know, he, he brings upon some ire, uh, I think they'd have a much easier time defeating her because of a lot of these scandals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think their, their support bases are going to do the mental gymnastics and ignore most of the scandals. Uh, and I and I think it has hurt Hillary. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, a lot of people compared Donald Trump to Barry Goldwater when he uh, mm -hmm. first got the nomination, and Barry Goldwater lost in one of the biggest landslides in American campaign history. And so the fact that this is still a decently close race. Uh, I mean, I checked out some of the numbers and. Hillary's down to about a 68, 69% chance being given of winning, which at one point that was high mid 80s. Um, so, I mean, I think without these scandals, uh, somebody like Bernie Sanders or many of the um, Democratic, other Democrats, uh, Democrats who could have ran, they would probably be leading by even more, uh, a higher percentage. So I think the scandals have had an impact. Okay. Yeah, and it's the idea that there's not just a scandal. You know, it's a cascading mm -hmm. effect of, well, let's talk about Benghazi for a while, and Benghazi gets talked out. And next thing you know, you're talking about the private mm -hmm. server and the emails, and then that gets talked out for a while, and, and then the Clinton Foundation stuff comes in, and the FBI investigation, and then suddenly there's more about Benghazi, and then, you know, these things are feeding off of each other and keeping the news cycle going. Uh, but I think on the other end, there might be a little bit of fatigue in the sense that we still don't like scandal, but well, scandals and Clintons go together like peanut butter and jelly. We've known that since the 90s, you know, except for his reprehensible personal behavior, Clinton did a great job running the country, so maybe scandals aren't gonna be a killer. Keeping with Hillary Clinton, how much this past weekend, I think it was Friday night, um, the FBI reopened their investigation into Hillary Clinton how much will that reopening of the case into Hillary's email scandal, how much will that impact her being so close to the election only days away? 
Well, it's going to be hard to tell. Um, we don't have, we're just now getting the public opinion polling in uh, after the reopening of the investigation because you know, polling, good polling takes time. Um, and then we also have the additional dynamic that usually at this point in campaigns and presidential elections, we do start getting a little bit of tightening of the race anyway. Um, again, because like I said, the media likes a horse race and it's not a good horse race unless it's a tight horse race. Um, so we're still not quite sure how much of that uh, will have an impact. I mean, she has dropped some points uh, overall, but we don't know for sure if it's due to the scandal or just a tightening. Yeah, I think it's a lot of, we don't know if there's any there there. Right. Uh, and there might be. There, it might be game-changing, but we're not going to know that until 2017 at some point. Um, I think what's happening is that the people who are never Hillary, why well, here we go again. And the people that are dead set that she's, I'm with her, well, here goes the media again, here goes the FBI again. I, I don't know that it's really changed a whole lot of minds. Yeah, I mean, there's some potential that it would you know, create more negative campaigning out there and moderates and independents might uh, choose not to participate in the election. Yeah. But at this point, we've had the most negative presidential campaign, you know, in our history. So I don't know if it's the straw that breaks the camel's back or it's just, oh, look, it's just another straw. Yeah, and I think that's the key is I don't know that this latest set of developments is going to switch anyone over to the Trump camp. I think the more likely scenario is that it might leave some Hillary people at home. And finally, um, what positive aspects does Hillary Clinton bring to the ballot? 30 years of experience. Uh, 30 years of experience in very key positions uh, throughout our, both in Arkansas and in D.C. Uh, if the power of the presidency is the power to persuade people to do jobs in a normal political environment, she'd be like the one of the ideal candidates. She has those connections. You know, she's been first lady. She's worked in the uh, U.S. Senate, but in this very polarized, very negative environment, um, I don't know how much power she's going to have, uh, how much ability she will have to persuade people to support her policies, but. That just three years of experience, connections. Uh, seems she seems to have a strong grasp on the issues and the policy possibilities to address issues and problems. Yeah, I, th I think if if you were to take her resume and put anyone else's name at the top, that would potentially be one of the most ideal presidential candidates you could come up with, just sitting around a table. Um, so if you take away the, the the personal problems and the problems of trustworthiness and the problems of, of maybe hubris, um, the experience, the the connections, the people that she's been working with on both sides of the aisle, um, I don't know that we've had a candidate with that much experience in quite a long time. Um, but you can't separate that stuff out, right? In the same way that you know Donald Trump's an outsider. And he brings a fresh new perspective, and he doesn't think like a politician, but well, you get his personality, too. Moving on from the candidates in the spotlight, let's look at some of the third-party candidates. Which of the third-party candidates, mainly Gary Johnson and Joe Stein, there are others, but mm -hmm. those two have had the most, even less so than Trump and Clinton, less that they would like, but which... Which third party candidate do you, do you believe has the best chance, even though it may seem like a long shot, which of those two do you believe, or which third party candidate overall do you believe has the best chance to pull off the upset? The only one, I think, and this is a long shot and you know, 50 things have to happen <laughs> all at once, uh, is Evan McMullen. Uh, I don't think Gary Johnson or Jill Stein or anyone else who's on the, any of these ballots has a chance because none of them is going to win an electoral vote because no one's going to get a majority or a plurality of the vote in any of the states. But McMullen may. Uh, latest poll came out, at, I want to say it was Quinnipiac poll, that he's a little bit behind now. 
Uh, but if he is able to pull off winning Utah, he gets six electoral votes. And if the rest of it's close, it could be where neither Trump nor Clinton gets 270. The election gets thrown to the House of Representatives. Each state gets a vote. And even though it's a majority of Republican states, there are a lot of people in the House that don't like Donald Trump, and he might be a good conservative alternative. But I think he's the only one that has a shot. Yeah, uh, you have to win something. Uh, getting seven percent of the vote nationally, you know, which seems to be a high prediction, uh, doesn't get you anything. Um, I mean, if you go back to 92 with Ross Perot, he gets 15, 18% of the vote, but doesn't win a single state. Uh, and so, that, I mean, that's more than twice what we're projecting these, uh, the top of the third party candidates to do in this election. And so, if you don't win a state, then when it goes to the electoral college vote, uh, there's going to be a clear winner. And which then just ends the third party candidate's only chance of winning. Uh, I will say if all those things possibly line up and we do have a you know, third party candidate who somehow wins the presidential election through the House of Representatives votes, that person's gonna be walking into the White House as a lame duck uh, yeah. Yeah. president who will not be able to get anything done during their four years because they do not have the popular mandate from the, from the public and they're just gonna look like an illegitimate political appointee almost. It, it is a complicated, but I think remarkable mm -hmm. system that we've almost never had to invoke and use, but uh, the top three electoral vote getters would go to the House, and meanwhile, the top two vice presidential candidates would go to the Senate. If the House can't reach a decision by January 20th, if they can't get them, because you need a majority, if they can't get a majority in the House, then whoever got the majority in the Senate becomes the one sworn in on January 20th. So we could have a President Pence or a President Kane. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's tomfoolery or shenanigans in the Electoral College in terms of, well, Trump won this state, but these electors don't want to vote for him, or you know, same thing for Hillary, then maybe Congress doesn't certify the vote um, come January, the first Monday in January. Considering the backlash to both candidates from both sides, and even from their own parties, how do we end up with two candidates that have so much dislike toward them from their own parties even? How do we end up with two candidates that are like that? I was hoping you could tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, well, when it comes to the case of Trump, we have 16 Republicans running um, in a day and an age when people just don't drop out of presidential elections anymore <laughs> as quickly as they used to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, before um, Citizens United ruling, uh, if you didn't do well in Iowa, you didn't get campaign donations to basically fund your campaign in New Hampshire. And if you didn't do well in New Hampshire, you had a hard time getting funding to run a campaign in South Carolina. Uh, in states that require large number of volunteers, door-to-door uh, -door politics, and so what, what has happened is these candidates are able to um, have political action committees that support them that are supported by billionaires who are funded almost completely by billionaires. And so they can survive placing fourth in Iowa, third in, in New Hampshire, and keep going, which keeps dividing the vote even further. Um, and so I think that's how Donald Trump was able to survive in despite the a large number of distrust in the Republican Party. Um, with Hillary, besides Bernie S Sanders, there wasn't much competition. Uh, and Bernie Sanders was a surprise for most uh, people, for most uh, people predicting this. I mean, she was almost, you know, the chosen one going into it. And she had such a large war chest that um, she was able to keep going in many of the same ways that Mitt Romney was able to do in um, 2012. And so I think, you know, that's part of the reason why we end up with these two candidates. Yeah, it was, I mean, Donald Trump was a sideshow when things first started, according to the people that were covering the race, uh, according to election experts. 
I put experts in quotes because we all got it wrong. Um, and as the vote was being divided 17 ways, you know, he was getting just enough to keep going and getting this free media attention that other mm -hmm. candidates weren't getting, which was then broadening his view and broadening his view. And, um, and I think Dr. Kerberg's right. Hillary Clinton was the heir apparent, right? That she, she played nice for eight years, like she was you know, expected to do as someone who lost the election and might have another chance. Um, and so really there was no one that was gonna rise up and, and challenge her. Uh, and it took someone who wasn't a Democrat someone who's democratic socialist and caucuses with the party but doesn't really identify as a mainstream Democrat to come in and, and challenge. Um, I, I don't know if, if it were to happen again, if it would happen any differently. Even looking back and realizing how disliked both candidates are and how distrusted both candidates are, I don't know that it would change anything if we had hindsight back then? I mean, I don't think so either. I mean, if you look at the Republican side, they knew that they were dividing up the vote. I mean, mm -hmm. they kept telling each other, hey, why don't you drop out and, and endorse me? And the other person was like, no, why don't you drop out and endorse <laughs> me? Yeah. And it just kept continuing. And then you had so many candidates who weren't winning states like Rubio, who was like, well, if I could just make it to Florida and win Florida, right. everything will change. And candidates don't survive that long, historically, long enough to get to Florida uh, without winning something along the way. And he, they were able to do it just because of all this uh, new funding that is pouring into elections. Yeah, and, and don't forget that there was, there's a different set of rules that applied mm -hmm. to Donald Trump and that still apply to Donald Trump. When another candidate would try to play his game, and I'm thinking of, Marco Rubio calling him out and, and mm -hmm. making fun of the size of his hands and things like that. And he was slammed for it, and rightfully so. But Trump does the same thing and doesn't get slammed for it because it's part of that media spectacle. It's what the viewers want. It's what his base is getting mm -hmm. excited about. Um, he's sort of Teflon in that sense. And so when other people try to play his game, they got squashed. And when they didn't play his game, they didn't get the attention, and the funding never showed mm -hmm. up. And the final question for you two, which direction do you think the state of Ohio will go in for this direction? Well, as a lifelong Ohioan, I can say that I am totally confused. Um, not exactly, but the traditional lines have been obliterated. Uh, I grew up in Youngstown, Ohio, which is traditionally uh, very blue. And there are a lot of Trump supporters there. Um, a lot of people who are unionized, a lot of people who see themselves as having lost jobs to NAFTA and to other trade deals and, and, and the world that has passed them by. Um, I see a lot of Republicans who are not supporting uh, Donald Trump. I see uh, independents who aren't sure where to go, many of which went to, to Johnson at first and sort of backed off. Um, after his Aleppo moment and other problems that he had. The traditional lines aren't there, and still it's split down the middle. So I would, I would predict Hillary Clinton, but I wouldn't put any money on it. Yeah, I mean, right now, uh, a lot of the predictions are that Trump's going to slightly pull it out here in Ohio, and that he needs to, uh, to win the presidency. Uh, but then, you know, I just saw some research just today that indicates that um, as candidates do poorly in the media, in this case Hillary Clinton due to the new, um, uh, due to the revival of the email scandal, the polling on those candidates is biased, is underreported, meaning that people when they're called to ask who are you gonna vote for, they might be a Hillary Clinton supporter in this case and they will just say undecided or they just won't answer the survey question. And so then we make all these predictions based upon these surveys, and now we're finding, oh, all the traditional lines are blurred or broken. And then, oh, now we're also underreporting people's support based upon the current news cycle. And I don't know how we correct for that in these predictions. Um, I mean, I'm still, I'm, I, 
I agree with Dr. King. I think Hillary might pull it out, but I think it's going to be by a small percentage difference. Uh, and if she does, well, when they announced, it might be the deciding moment of this presidential election. No Republicans ever got into the White House with that Ohio. Yeah. Dr. Kerber, Dr. King, I thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you all for watching. Be sure to tune in to Orbit TV and log on to orbitmediaonline.com for more news and information. I'm Logan Weaver. Have a good night.